Conquering Manhood. Command your legacy. Take action. And conquer all. To the Conquer Manhood Podcast, where we talk to today's conquerors, men and women who will mentor or inspire us to conquer all. Your journey is defined by you, but each week I bring you a unique featured conqueror who has an inspiring story or a life hack that we can try and emulate. In today's session, we talk about the catalyst that took him out of his grown boy behaviors, how to turn your mistakes into lessons so that you can help others. Marriage hacks so that you can learn to fight fairly within your, within your home, or better yet, not fight at all. And the two things that men struggle with most. It all goes down in session 003, but before we kick it off, I want to give a shout out to this session's giveaway, which is audiobooks. They got over 60,000 books in audiobook format. Listen to the end of the show on how to enter the Big A giveaway and your chance to win. Now, let's get on with the show. Conqueror Nation, I'm ecstatic you decided to join us today. Our next feature conqueror is this highly respected, highly sought after life and relationship coach, entrepreneur, author, and fellow disciple of Christ, husband, father, and conqueror. He's been featured on, ex- on as an expert on television shows as Oprah, CNN, the Tyra Banks show, Fox News. Uh, he speaks across the globe, inspiring others and spreading his message all while improving people's lives, businesses, and relationship. Conquer Nation, the one and only Tony Gaskins. Tony, thank you for coming on the show today, my man. Hey, hey, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Awesome, Tony. So I got to tell you a little bittersweet uh, way that I got introduced to you was, you know, I had no idea who Mr. Tony Gaskin was. And, and when I used to mess up, when I was a man mess in my relationship with my wife, Mm-hmm. she would leave me subliminal messages on Facebook and it'd be like a, one of your quotes or one of your pictures. And uh, and I would only know that they were directed towards me and I would be like, who is this Tony, man? <laughs> <laughs> and she's speaking to me through this image. And, uh, you know, and so I hate, it pricked my pride. I go check it out and I'm like, oh man, this guy's, uh, this guy's the truth. This is good to go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, wow. that's, that's how I got introduced to Mr. Tony Gaskins. Wow, that is awesome. That is awesome. Small world. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, Tony. Well, here at Conquer Manhood, we love to start off with a success quote or a mantra that has that you use or that that you apply to your life. That's you know that you apply to yourself whenever you feel yourself swaying left or right. Can you give us what that quote is and how you apply it to your life? If you don't build your dream, someone will hire you to build theirs. And that is my quote. Um, there's been different versions of it that I found up and I tweeted that. And somebody who follows me was running a site. They kind of took it and put it on a, a, you know, a colorful background, put my name on it. And it traveled the, the globe. It went viral, it, you know, hit 400 different countries. Uh, they quoted me on the Today Show um, my partner was in Brazil listening to a keynote at some type of seminar and the keynote speaker quoted me and he had my quote tattooed on his rib cage <laughs> and, um, and he showed it was in code language because he, he owned the social media networking site um, in Brazil with like two million um, subscribers wow. and and I, I said that in a moment of desperation when I was kind of transitioning from working for somebody else to working for myself in 2011, and I just remind myself of it all the time. Wow, you know what, Tony? And uh, and and I've seen this quote by other, yeah, other people who are doing it all the time. And and in the moment I saw it, it, it spoke directly to me, resonated with me. And it's such a powerful quote, especially for entrepreneurs and people that are just eager to sit out there and do something for themselves. You know? Yeah, yeah. All right, Tony. So let's begin with your story. When did you discover your purpose through coaching and and just the you know the relationship coaches? Can you guide us through that journey and how and how it set you up to where you are today? Well, I was I was raised as an athlete, 
you know, I was an athlete and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professional basketball or football player. And I always excelled from when I was young, seven years old, all the way through high school. I remember being in, you know, city league scoring four touchdowns in a game, averaging 22 points a game, went on to high school. I averaged 10.2 yards a carry. I averaged the first down as a running back. Um, I averaged 18 points a game in basketball, and that's what I wanted to do. And I ended up sitting out my senior basketball season and playing football. Uh, And my father and my basketball coach got into it. So my father took me off the team, um, I guess just out of ego football to fall back on so I went to college on a full football scholarship but I I didn't appreciate it I didn't respect it football wasn't my first love basketball was and when I was redshirted as a freshman which means you know it's just like a free year for you it doesn't count against your eligibility I just got caught up you know trying to be cool trying to fit in trying to find my way and I started selling drugs out of the dorm room because everybody was smoking marijuana. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't even curse. But just trying to find my way to fit in because I didn't drink, smoke, and curse, I started selling marijuana. All my cousins back home did it. And, you know, chasing the ladies. I was a ladies man. And I had the most women. And three years into that lifestyle in college, trying to balance, you know, this image I was putting on. came home. I was 21 years old. I still had two years of school left and I didn't know who I was and I met my wife that same year uh, later that year when I started school in the fall back home in Tampa Florida and she was really that the, the catalyst in my life that really spoke into my life and called me out you know called out my grown boy behavior and just by her being there and standing up for herself and me seeing her value and her worth and me wanting to to keep her, I realized I had to grow up and I had to change um, in order to keep her. And so that's really what pushed me. And then it was kind of like the prodigal son. I went back home. I went back to my roots, which I knew God. I knew the word of God. I was, you know, I'm a Christian. That's when I really got serious, you know, really got serious about living my purpose And so I wrote a book on relationships and started just pushing it. You know, I said, hey, in two years at 25, I want to be on Oprah. And almost two years to the date, I was sitting on Oprah telling a portion of my story, being a toxic, controlling boyfriend in college. And I just went from there. You know, my whole purpose became taking my mistakes and turning my mistakes into lessons to help other people. Wow, that's powerful. So, Tony, you you mentioned when you were living a a life of chaos and you came into and you met your relationship and you met your wife. Did you bring in some of your old habits and your your baggage into that relationship? Yes, I did. I I brought in that controlling mentality, short temper. Um, I believe it had a lot to do with my upbringing, what I saw growing up, and then also just playing the sport of football. You know, it's a very dangerous sport. It's a combat sport. It really rewires the way you think and the way you approach life just because, you know, you are in combat and you feel like you're fighting for your life. So you do become aggressive, you know, Mm. off the field too. And that affected me. And so I was, I was struggling, you know, just not knowing who I was. And I wanted to be a professional athlete, but I didn't have the dedication to that sport. I had the skill, but I didn't have the dedication. And so I brought that into my relationship, just that controlling, insecurity, grown boy mentality. And my wife, she dumped me two months into our relationship. And I went back to my ex. She went back to her ex. And neither one of the relationships worked out. And we ended up back together six months later. You know, we crossed paths again and we hit it off. And that time when we hit it off the second time, I knew I had to get it right. I knew I had to do better. I still made mistakes in that first uh, 10 months. We got married in 10 months um, because and right after we got married, I decided I was going to go back to the street life with my cousins, you know, selling drugs. And she left me. She left me then and we had a newborn baby 
in the intensive care unit. And for her to leave me not having a job, a son in an intensive care unit, it showed me how much she loved herself and that she was unwilling to compromise. And unless I would grow up, I wouldn't have my wife, you know, the woman of my dreams or my child. Yeah. Who, and so it, that's what really pushed me. I had to get over those habits if I wanted to have something in life. Wow. And so I, I want to go back to, you know, kudos to your wife. That, that's amazing for her. And, uh, and you know, that's a, that's a lesson that I want our female audience to take away is, hey, you know, know yourself, know your self-worth and, and make that man in your life uh, respect that and understand that as well. Right. right. Um, I, I want to ask you, Tony, how did you, what was your mindset uh, and what gifted you in this manner to say, hey, I, I'm going to write this book and I, and I decided that I wanted to be on the Oprah show. And so how did, you know, a lot of people don't have that connection between one and two like that, that, that you are able to declare that and then actually see it through. Right, right. I don't know. It was just like a blind faith. It was just that courageous mentality. I think the same thing that kind of ticks in in a lot of athletes, just it was ticking in me. And I had nothing to lose. You know, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I said, you know what? I need to get on Oprah. I had never even watched her show, but I knew (laughs) she was an authority. (laughs) And and so I just went to Oprah.com and I started pitching every day just telling my story because I knew she told stories on her show and she let people come on and talk about their life story. And, you know, she would teach a lesson from their story. And I just was pitching and I said, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes. And that's what my book was. It was all of my love and relationship mistakes, you know, because I was a huge player. And so when I got with my wife, I knew that if I couldn't even yell at her, if I couldn't do little petty stuff, I knew I couldn't cheat on her and get caught and get away with it. So I knew that I was going to have to turn in my player card. And so by so because I was going to have to retire from the game, in my mind, every other man has to retire too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, if Jordan walks away from the game, the game is over. Yeah. It's not and that was my mentality. And so I just said, "Hey, You know, I'm going for the gusto. I didn't make it to the NFL um, or the NBA. So I need to be at the top of another field. All right. So, Tony, I follow you on social media uh, and I see you everywhere. And and I always ask myself, you know, like with all the traveling that you do all over the world and all the people that you're inspiring and touching, how do you personally keep all these spinning plates up? You know, God leading your family any personal interests that you have of your own, how do you manage it all, Tony? Man, you know, it's so tough. You know, it is so tough. Um, I, I cannot sit and say that, oh, it's easy. It is fun. You know, it is fun. It's a blast. Tomorrow morning, well, I actually have to get up in about uh, four hours to go catch a plane to Montreal, Canada, because I have to speak there on Saturday. And, you know, it's a blast. And I just got back from another city and on riding home today, just got an invite from the NBA again because you only get a one year contract from the NBA to speak to the NBA rookies um, next month on August 11th at the rookie transition program. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that I'm doing professionally. And then having my wife and my two boys, we have an eight year old, a one year old, um, I just bought a new house for us and we're getting ready to move in. And I remember probably like a week ago, man, I I just I broke down, not like broke down uh, depressed, like wanting to take pills, but broke down, sat and just was thinking and kind of with my head down and almost in tears. And I was saying, you know what? I take care of everybody. But who takes care of me? You know, because I come from a place where nobody really makes it out. So now that I've made it out, everybody comes to me for money. Any problem they have, if they sat behind me in class, they're coming and asking me for money. Yeah, I don't even know. Them. And, you know, it's just it's it gets stressful. And so I say, you know what? I got to take care of me. You know, I got to do something so that I can feel like I can reap the benefits of, of my hard work. 
And so I just kind of woosaw, relaxed, and said, you know what? I'm going to cut my phone off at 5 p.m. That's the end of the work day. I'm going to spend time with family. I'm going to benefit from some of my success. I was driving a 2012 Tahoe. I loved it. You know, I had it matte matte uh wrap on it and some black wheels i went and bought me a maserati (laughs) i bought me a maserati and said you know what i'm gonna treat myself i've worked hard and sacrifice let me feel on earth because i know i'm gonna go to heaven because of my lifestyle that i live i said let me feel the benefits and reap the benefits on earth and just just that small act of telling myself that I love myself and I appreciate myself and that I'm going to make myself a priority um, and take out time for myself and gift myself. It just kind of changed my mindset, you know, and it put a stamp on things that said, you know, you are worth nothing to the world if you don't take care of you and your your mentality, and uh, your emotions, your health. And so I just kind of, you know, I had to remind myself of that every day, all day. And it's a Every day is it's a battle that you got to get up and fight, you know. Yeah. All right, Tony. Uh, so, if you had to give somebody advice that's trying to be out there, he, he, if somebody's trying to you know take their own path and do what you're doing, what's one piece of advice that you would provide for them? Be authentic. It's the hardest thing to do to be authentic, and I struggle with it too. You know, just feeling stifled, feeling pigeonholed, trapped, feeling like you can't uh, be and do what you really want to do and be who you really are. But I realize the closer I get to my true identity and my true purpose, my true thoughts and my true feelings, the more successful I become. And I think it's a it's a process for us all because we fear criticism. We fear being you know alienated or ostracized by the public and by friends, by family. And deep down, we desire excellence. We desire greatness. But because majority of people are mediocre and average, sometimes greatness scares us because we realize that in order to be great, it's almost like being an eagle. And I I released an album, a spoken word album on iTunes called Greatness. And one of the tracks is Eagles and Turkeys. And it's talking about how eagles soar alone at the highest heights. But turkeys, they flock together and they're led to the slaughter every day. They end up on a dinner plate every day. But you you never see an eagle. You've never seen an eagle on a dinner plate. And it's that mentality. It's that separation. So for me as a man, for me to say I'm not even going to use a curse word, I'm not going to get drunk, I'm not going to gamble, I'm not going to watch pornography. I'm not going to masturbate. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. I'm not um, going to go to the club. I'm, for me to cut everything out, you know, that works against my growth as a person, that separates me from 99.9% of men. Out of all those things that I've just said that I don't do, Almost every man that I meet does at least one of those things. So it separates me. I still have another level to go, which is sleeping right, eating right, and working out regularly. Hmm. Once I do those three things, I'm going to feel perfect. <laughs> I'm going to feel like a perfect human being, to be honest with you. But and, and I pursue perfection. I know it's not attainable, but I believe it was Vince Lombardi said that, you know, pursue perfection even though it's not attainable, because along the way you'll catch excellence. Yeah. He said a little differently, but that was the gist of it. And and that's what I would say. Be who you really know you need to be and, ho- and who you really are, even if it separates you from everybody else and you feel lonely at times. Know that you will be comforted you know, by your family because you're going to bring your family up with you, your husband, your wife, your kids. And you're going to inspire others to get their act together. And you're going to realize that you ultimately you won't be alone in the climb. I love, I love it. And I love the, the Vinzati uh, quote as well. Uh, Tony, what's, 
I want to touch on your on your current life now and uh, and just your vision, so we can see where Tony Gaston is going in the future. What's exciting you about your business today and your purpose, and uh, what do you see for the future? Because I know you've written multiple books, you speak all over the country, and you got a few products and coaching and classes to bring people themselves to the next level. So, what do you have for the future? You know, I I pretty much lay the groundwork. I, I've laid the the infrastructure. And now it's just building, you know, just building on top of what I have. I have a billion dollar infrastructure, you know, in the sense that what I mean by that is Oprah is a billionaire. I have an infrastructure that is as strong as hers, because when you look at Oprah, she's really just a personality on television. And that has helped her become a billionaire. So I have that skill set and that ability, but then also I have things that Oprah doesn't have. You know, I have online courses. I've written several books. Um, I am a coach. I do live seminars, um, one on one coaching, group coaching. And so I decided to put this infrastructure in place. I remember my dad used to look look at me and say, son, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. You have too many products, too many projects that you've created. I said, dad, sit back and watch. Just sit back Hmm. and watch. I'm telling you that I'm not doing all of these things at one time. I'm putting them all in place. I'm laying a foundation so that when I peak, when I hit my peak and a hundred million people know who I am, I got every product imaginable that I can produce out of my gifts and my skill set so that that one million to a hundred million people has something that they can gain from my life and I will leave a legacy on this earth. And in the process, it'll allow me to take care of my family beyond my wildest dreams. And so really right now, it's just about consistency, staying, remaining consistent and just pushing forward. You know, I can, I'm going to continue to write books. I have one right now called Real Love. That is my journey to love. It's my story, almost like a memoir, I guess you would say. And, I'm getting ready to release it in about a month or two. Um, That's also the beauty of being independent. You can pick your cover. You can pick your title. You can pick your release date. And then you you keep all the money, too. Yeah. uh, Which, you know, is different when you go traditional. But that's that's the goal. And eventually to get on television. But not necessarily to stay there, but to kind of see what it's like and to see if I can shift the culture um, or break the mold, so to speak, on television, because I've been on several shows and I kind of see how it works. And I know my personality doesn't fit doing what Oprah does um, because of the fact that largely a lot of television people, they aren't individuals, you know, they're, they're puppets, you know, they have individuals sitting behind the scenes who write everything that they're going to say. And they may have some original thoughts, but because they do it every day, you get tired and they start to just delegate everything. And so you literally go on a show and you see this person that you look up to, you know, and they're just reading off a card that somebody else gave them. And you're really just a a multimillionaire moderator, you know, Hmm. and they're not really, you know, changing lives themselves with their story, you know, with their, through their purpose. Um, and, and the same with reality television. I've done that a lot too. And I just kind of see behind the scenes. So I, I'm pushing that way because that gives you that credibility to where people look and say, okay, you've made it. You're a celebrity. Um, so you almost kind of have to get it, but I'm not sure it's somewhere that I would want to stay. I think I will get the platform and then do something different with it. I see. Pray that you, uh, many blessings with that one. Tony, I, I know before you have this amazing infrastructure, it hasn't always been the glitz and the glam and everything hasn't been successful. Uh, we all have failure. So as you've progressed in your journey, uh, what has been the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome? Tell us that story and then the lessons you learned with that. Uh, you know, I, I think it's all your mindset, to be honest with you. And I, I think my biggest challenge is myself. You know, that's that's really my only obstacle. And that's my only competition. And that's my only failure is my mindset limiting myself because of the fear 
of what people will think or what people will say. And then stepping out and being who who I am and saying what I want to say and then receiving backlash that kind of hurts so bad that makes you go back into that shell and bite your tongue. But knowing that you're called for something greater. And this is what I believe is that God gives us all a call and a purpose, but you have to be so bold and so courageous that a lot of the greatest leaders were slain. And if you are called to change the world, um, you have to be willing to be criticized. You got to be willing to be stressed, uh, to be, you know, ran ragged. And so to be honest with you, any, everything that I've done, I don't see anything as a failure because I, I've never done something like take a million dollars and invest it in a startup and then the company fails in a year. I don't take those type of you know, risks. So yeah. n- nothing that I've done, I consider a failure because I wrote a book. I started pitching it. I was let down my first royalty check because I thought it was going to be $12,000 because I told myself, not knowing anything about the industry, that you know, in three months, my book will sell like a thousand copies a month. I make four dollars a copy. So that's four thousand dollars a month times three. That's twelve thousand because it's on Amazon. People will be searching for a relationship book and they'll bump into my book on accident. So because Amazon is so big, I'll sell a thousand books a month on accident, not knowing anything about the industry. That's what I thought would happen. So I was expecting a royalty check of twelve thousand dollars. And my first royalty check was three hundred and seventy dollars <laughs> <laughs> and so that was for me that's the biggest setback the biggest failure um that i've had you know it just let down but every other thing in my life when i was working eight dollars and fifty cents an hour as a as a counselor uh counseling young men but then also an author and a speaker and when people thought that i was full-time author and speaker And after Oprah, I still had to work another two years after Oprah at eight fifty to nine fifty an hour. Um, You know, I didn't see any of it as as failure. I saw it as as decline. I didn't see it as an obstacle. I saw it as a process. You know, I saw it as a hurdle instead of a roadblock. And I just kept pressing. And I began to realize that there's growth in the climb, and that the longer it takes, the greater you are destined for because. God is preparing you and allowing you to get the lessons so that you can be sustained at the top. Because a lot of people, you go from the bottom to the top very quickly, and then you don't know how to handle the top. And so I just enjoy the climb. I embrace the climb. I embrace the struggle. I embrace the obstacles. And it's really just all about a mindset. And so for me right now, my biggest challenge is Tony Gaskins being and doing what I really am and saying what I really feel, what God has really put on my heart to speak to this generation and knowing that it's not going to be popular because we're in a generation of everything goes, everything's okay, um, anything, you know, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And I don't believe that you can have structure and that you can have progress if anything goes, if you don't have morals and you don't have values and a set of standards. And so I know that it's going to come a time to where I'll become the voice of my generation. And already now, I don't know a 31 year old or anybody under the age of 35 that reaches 30 million people a week. Um, and you know, who does exactly what I do in the way that I do it. So in a lot of ways, I'm kind of already in that position, and but just still moving towards giving 120 percent to it. That's that's amazing. And you and you mentioned it before. You know, you you're trying to reach perfection, and it's it's about the journey. And uh, you know, we might not never attain it, but it's about the journey. Right. Yeah. All right, right, Tony. So what I want to do now is I want to go into what I call the man up round, and it's a, a series of short questions. You hit us up, uh, but. Uh, we get to peek into the mind of Tony Gaskin and see how he thinks, and uh, let's have a little bit of fun with this one. But before we do, let's thank today's sponsors. Audiobooks wants to tell you a story, and they have over 60,000 books in audio format. Make your next book one that will aid you on your journey of conquering manhood. Go to audiobooks.com slash conquer for a free 30-day subscription plus a credit towards any book of your choice. 
If you need web hosting, I recommend InMotionHosting.com. If you want a 38% off your web hosting plan plus a free domain name, check out ConqueringManhood.com slash hosting to get that deal plus some bonus material from me. Now, back to the show. So, Tony, the first question is, is uh, out of all you've done, what has been your proudest man moment? Outside of, when you say man moment, outside of my wife and my two boys, you know, buying a six-bedroom house and a Maserati and a Jeep Wrangler in the same month <laughs> um, and, and a Rolex, uh, that felt good. You know, I, ha- I have to say it felt good. It felt like a reward, like a huge reward. You know, because money isn't the goal, you know, touching lives is money was my goal for the first year or maybe two years that I started. And then I still was broke. And so I switched it to say now instead of counting dollars, I want to count lives. And that's when everything changed for me. So to get to that point to where, you know, I have all the things that money can't buy. I have a beautiful wife and two beautiful boys and there's no fussing and fighting in my household. My wife and I haven't argued in over five years. Mm. And that's that's because I taught myself how to love. And then I led in love and she reciprocated my love. And so being the head of the household, I create that situation. I create an environment in my home. So I have no stress or anxiety or anything from my wife and my kids. Um, it's just outside of that. And so to have all the things that money can't buy, that's the greatest accomplishment. But then to also be able to buy a few things that kind of, you know, just boost your spirits. Um, I would say outside of that, that's been my greatest man moment. <laughs> this, this, that's all right. You got to treat yourself. And Tony, this, this wasn't going to be the question, but how do we live? Let that one go away. So you haven't argued with your wife for five years what what's what's the what's the hack you know what you said you purposely had set the tone in the house so that it is that way we got to know how do we attain this right well for one i don't do anything that would make her want to argue meaning i'm 100 percent faithful so that's first and foremost she doesn't have to find text uh message on facebook anything like that she can have my phone the whole day um i cheat on her with my purpose and so that's the whenever she wants to get mad at somebody from taking time from her, she has to talk to God and say, God, why did you give him this purpose to reach 30 million people a week? Because it steals my attention sometimes. Yeah. And then outside of that, we have a rule. If it's not worth getting the divorce over, it's not worth arguing over. Oh, wow. And so we will have disagreements. But inside of those disagreements, we understand you have to wait an hour, at least an hour before you address it. When you address it, the person who brings it up, they get to talk and not get cut off. There's no yelling. There's no name calling. There's no cursing. There's no storming away. And we talk for an hour and then we both internalize. We look at ourselves, and then we see what we can do better to serve the other person. So we seek to understand then be understood. So without reacting to situations, but instead responding to situations without yelling, without cursing, without name calling, um, that has minimized all arguments. Thank you for that. And I know that's going to resonate with a whole lot of gentlemen out there. Uh, Tony, through all your coaching, what has been the most surprising thing that you learned about women and what they want in a relationship? I think the most surprising thing is just how women were solely created to serve man. Just that that is just it's mind boggling to me that when God said, let me this man needs to help me. Let me create Eve. That that's all God did was create a woman for man like he he did not create Eve and say, She's going to have her own talk show and be the CEO um, of a Fortune 500 company. Now, he put her mindset and gave her the ability to do that. But the number one thing inside of women is to serve a man. And so it makes me like really want to ram my head through a wall when I'm coaching and I see how gullible and how naive and how forgiving 
and just, you know, that women are. And I'm like, wow. Like, because as men, we're not wired like that. Like, it, if a woman looks at a man too hard, we're filing for a divorce. Yeah. You know, it's like, but women, like, I, I coach women and they've been cheated on 10 times. They've been left by the man 10 times when he gets bored and they let him come back. The, he has a baby outside of the relationship. We saw in the media, Dwayne Wade had a baby on Gabrielle Union. She married him. Uh, Ludacris had a baby on his girl. She married him. It's like, it's like, wow, like, man. But imagine as a man, if Gabrielle Union got pregnant by another man, would Dwayne Wade be there? Absolutely not. He would be gone in an instant. And that's what really just mind boggles me is that God created us to love and to reproduce. Everything else is just man, it's man-made to love and reproduce, you know, and the, the man is the head. If he knows how to lead, you know, it can be beautiful. And the woman is his support system. She's the backbone. She's the CEO of home. And if she understands her influence, she can make a man a millionaire, a billionaire, uh, she could take him to the highest heights if she understands her influence and she and if she understands her essence and her worth and that she gets nothing out of this man if she lays down and lets him run over her. But if she stands her ground and she loves and respects herself, she can influence him to be one of the greatest men on earth. And and I totally agree with you, uh, but it's not to minimize or downsize uh, the woman's role outside of a marriage right i mean no they because they, they can still be they can have all the the success that they want individually but still maintain that world because you're saying that they're hardwired that way because of god they are wired for love so this is the thing if you offer a man a billion dollars and the key to the world or a happy marriage Nine out of 10 men may take that billion dollars and the key to the world. But if you offer a woman the love of her lifetime that will sweep her off her feet, her Prince Charming, or to be CEO of a Fortune 500 company, nine out of 10 women, they're going to choose love of a lifetime. And so what I'm saying is that a woman is created so wonderfully and fearfully by God that it allows her to be able to be a CEO and to earn six figures, to be the CEO of home and to start her own business and run her own business. But because men are not faithful and because we don't respect her and appreciate her and put her on a pedestal and treat her like a queen, she was driven to come out of the household and to find a way Mm. to make a living and uh, to start her own career And to tap into her dreams outside of that man. Mm. But when a woman is absent, like my wife, because she is taken care of, she was in school to be a doctor. But because she has real genuine love that knocks her off her feet, it's like I I have to almost force her to do something else. And a lot of times women don't even really understand it or realize it because they haven't had that choice of real love versus a career. Yeah, They have a man who is cheating on them, disrespecting them, taking them for granted. So they fall in love with their career and they pursue money and accolades and the corporate ladder because they haven't experienced the greatest gift given to mankind. And that's love. So even with me having real love now and also having money and notoriety, fame, whatever you want to call it, I realize what means the most. And a lot of days I feel like retiring because love feels so good that it's almost like you want to kick your feet up and just be in love. And the Bible says the greatest gift given to man is love. And so I say that to say not to minimize a woman outside of the household, but to say the strangest thing that I've found is how much a woman is wired to love and to nurture that's that's clear. I think you I think you hit right over the head. That's that's beautiful. All right. What advice would you give Tony to someone who has yet found their purpose? That's a good question. But I think the answer is inside of us all. And to be honest with you, we all we were born with our purpose, 
And so we don't have to find it. We just have to uncover it. And to identify your purpose, you have to identify your gifts, your passion, and then use it to serve. So whatever you do, understand that it is meant for you to serve, whether that be one person at a time or using your gift to gain a platform to serve millions. And that's purpose, your gift, because it comes freely and it comes easy in your passion, which sometimes your passion isn't what you're gifted at. So we have to realize that because sometimes we're chasing a fantasy instead of a dream and a dream is connected to purpose. A fantasy is connected to pleasure or money. And so when you identify your natural gifts, what do you do well? What comes easy? What comes natural? And then you become passionate about that gift and then you allow it to give you a platform so that you can serve people or the world at large. And that's purpose. And I think once I realized that, I realized, man, I was born uh, a millionaire mm. I, and, and, and God intended for me to be blessed on earth just by serving the world because it's like sowing a seed. You're sowing the seed and you reap a harvest. The harvest is always going to be greater than the seed that was sown. And that's how our purpose is. When we live our purpose, what we get back from living that purpose is going to feel so much greater you know, than even what we're doing to give. Like the, the the reward is so great that it becomes addicting to living your purpose. It's like, man, this is worth it. It's two paychecks. You get to serve the people, do what you love, and be taken care of. It, it's it's kind of like that Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 22, when it says, uh, do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings, and they will not serve before officials or low, or low ranks. So you just got to give into your gifts and... Uh, and you will serve among kings, right? Yes, that's powerful. That's beautiful. I love it. Tony, besides the Bible, what is the most influential book that you've ever read? Uh, to be honest with you, this is going to be kind of you know, interesting to you. But I, I just started reading books this year. Um, and <laughs> I just, for me, the Bible was the only source. And it wasn't just the Bible in itself. It was more so serving God in spirit and in truth. Because you got to realize that we are made in his image. And there's some people who are illiterate and they can't read the Bible. But that doesn't mean you can't get to know God because God is in you. And so for me, I, you know, I, I have just started reading books and I don't read them because reading is fundamental. I listen to them. I listen to the audio book. So if you don't have, if you don't have an audio book, I really can't, you know, uh, get into your book. Just because like reading is fundamental and I didn't have to read growing up. I know how to read. I can read very well and I write books. <laughs> That's the crazy thing about it. I've written several books, but when I started writing books, I had never read a book. And when I turned it into my publisher, because I did the internet publishing in my first book, they was like, how have, you know, you have this outline just like a book. It's laid out already like a book. I said, well, you know, I, I just had an idea. You know, I've looked at a book. I've seen a book, <laughs> uh, you know. And so I had an idea of this, how it's supposed to be laid out. And um, But that's what let me know as well that, to be honest with you, we need to not get so caught up in reading other people's books, but writing our own, looking at our life and writing our life, looking at our gifts and our skills and our purpose and leaving our mark on the world. And, uh, and, I, and I think I would say uh, this uh, Think and Grow Rich, they're probably Napoleon Hill by Napoleon Hill. Just all of the different nuggets of just, you know, your mindset, which not even really about money, but just your mindset and tapping into your thoughts um, and the power of positive Thinking, I believe it is, by Norman Vincent Peale. I listened to that. Um, and before all of that, it was Zig Ziglar. I stopped listening to rap music and to R&B, what I you know, was listening to, because it, it wasn't edifying my spirit. It wasn't building me up. And I started listening to podcasts. And I fell in love with Zig Ziglar's podcast because um, he didn't curse. He talks about God. He's a Christian. Uh, the late, great Zig. And he 
he has a country accent because he's from Mississippi. <laughs> and, and so I related to him more so than, you know, Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and Les Brown and Brian Tracy and Jack Canfield, John Maxwell. And so I, I love Zig's stuff. And he had like hundreds of podcasts on iTunes that his family put up, uh, his company put up, and they're free. So I just downloaded all of them onto my iPhone. And when I was driving to work, and driving home, that's all I would listen to. At work, I would have my phone in my pocket and the headset plugged in one of my ears. And Zig would be playing the entire time while I'm working. You know, people talking to me and stuff, and I'm talking to them. But as soon as they stop talking, I'm back listening to Zig. And it just started to change. He says a quote that says, your input determines your output, and your output will determine your income. And just by me putting that new knowledge in my mindset, it changed my life in two years. And so there, I, there is power, whether you read books or whether you listen to books or whether you just meditate and you become the book and reading yourself and your behaviors and what you need to do better. Uh, there's just power in, in all, any version of it. I agree with you. And uh, Concord Nation, you guys know, if you want to get a book like uh, The Napoleon Hill or Six Ziglar's Work, uh, you can go to audiobooks.com slash conquer and get any book for free. And uh, just like Tony and myself, leaders read or we listen. We, we listen to books and, uh, and that, that's powerful. Thanks a lot, Tony. Uh, Tony, you're the number one relationship coach out there from celebrity coaching to everyday average couples. Looking back on all your coaching, is there any trends that we men continually get wrong? Communication and commitment. Those are the two things that men struggle with the most, uh, expressing yourself, how you really feel, what you're thinking um, in a way that is digestible. You know, a lot of times we express ourselves by yelling, by cursing, imposing our will, throwing things against the wall, um, just kind of going off, just just being the bigger and the stronger vessel, trying to, as Dr. Gary Chapman calls it, uh, coercion by fear trying to instill fear in the woman so that she does what we want her to do. So that, right, that communication and then commitment, you know, that's the number one thing right there is commitment. It's, I really, I, I haven't been around a faithful man, you know, to, to where I felt like in my heart and in my spirit that he's 100% faithful to his, to his woman. I, I just, I haven't felt it or, or and not, I've been around men who are faithful because they're forced, because they don't have options, you know, but not men who have the ability to cheat and women kind of throwing themselves at them or putting themselves in in their path and then them turning it down. I haven't met enough of those men um, more than I can count on my hand. Yeah. And I, I think that's the biggest problem. It's the biggest it's the biggest downfall to mankind, to society, to our world. And I, I just I, I wish we could get it right, man. I wish we could, because I think it'll it'll minimize everything, you know, crime, AIDS, poverty, everything. If men could learn how to be faithful, because if you're faithful, you're a great husband, you're a great father. If you're a great father and a great husband, the likelihood of you raising a girl that's going to become pregnant as a teenager or a boy that's going to graduate to the penitentiary it goes down to like, you know, 10 percent chance if you're a great husband and a great father. And when you look at that, that minimizes teenage pregnancy. It minimizes STDs. It minimizes crime. That's the solution to our problem. So that's why I go so hard on, on, on the men. And that's why I give women so much advice to kind of counteract what the men are doing, because I know a man can be 100 percent wrong but make a woman think he's 100% right just because of how he imposes his will. And guys get mad at me, but I am that way because I understand that when I accept the responsibility for my life, everything in my life changed. I was making $19,000 a year. I was verbally abusive. I was on the verge of a breakdown. My wife, I was driving her crazy. And because of my ways, when I changed those ways, and I accept the responsibility for my life, everything changed. You know, I became worth millions of dollars. 
I started reaching millions of people a week online. I became an international speaker, best-selling author. Everything in my life changed. And it feels so good that I tell people at my seminars, if I get off of this stage and I walk in my room and a woman is butt naked on my bed, I will throw her her clothes. I may throw up on her and then walk out. <laughs> and and literally just because I have become that far distanced from infidelity because of how amazing life feels when you have self reap from your focus and your ambition having real direction without distraction. Wow. And so, I mean, that ties into what I wanted to ask you next was, was what, what was your philosophy on men and, and then why they cheat? Because I've seen that men, boys, until they become clear on their legacy, their purpose and where they're going in life, you know, they're just aimlessly walking without a vision. So not knowing themselves, not even setting, you know, core values for themselves or, of self boundaries. So why do you, why is it that, that we are just wired to that besides, you know, the fact that we're just sexual beings that we need to reproduce and, and all that yada yada stuff. Well, I, I believe the key and the answer, you know, and an atheist and a, a Muslim, um, you know, uh, you know, w- would disagree with me. But I believe the key is is Christ, you know, and knowing Christ. And the, here's the thing: is that we're all born with dispositions. We're all born with something wrong with us. We're born um, imperfect. As, as sinners. And the only way to rewire your being, your mindset, your body, the way it operates, the way you function, the way you think, the way you move about life is to connect with your creator because he created you that way. He gave you that imperfect imbalance. And so you have to connect with him to ask for the strength for the wisdom, for the faith, for the focus, for the clarity to rewire your being. So that is why we call it being born again, because you are born a sinner and you're born imperfect. And until you connect with your creator and become born again, that's when you come out a new creature. So for me, I see women and I see their beauty. And I may see a nice butt, nice thighs, nice breasts, and it may register in my mind. Those are nice thighs, but that is as far as it go. I don't think to uh, lust after or, or think about going any further with her, having sex with her, approaching her, talking to her. It's just that I'm not blind. I can see. And I see this woman, but that's what she is, one of God's beautiful creations. I have one of my own. So I'm going to go home and cuddle and kiss and spend time with her. Mm-hmm. And, like, and like you say, it is almost impossible for a man until he identifies his purpose. And I believe that's why I believe we as fathers have to start teaching our kids their purpose at a young age, boys and girls. And truthfully, to be honest with you, we are, we can literally put it on the fact that we're wired that way. And here's the thing. If it was so easy to control, the human race would cease to exist. Because if just off a whim or a notion, we can say, I want to be faithful and or or, or, I don't want to have sex. If men didn't have that drive, that sexual drive there would be no reproduction because we would be so focused on just getting money and success and fame that sex wouldn't even matter to us. But God made it to where those drives are almost equal. Um, They're pretty much equal. Your drive for, you know, success and money and for sex, success and sex. Those are the two things that drive men. And we have to learn how to balance them both. And I think the only way you can understand life and how to make it work is to go to the creator and get the owner's manual and read that and study that and then do what you read. And that's what I did. That's what I did. I read the Holy Bible. That's why I don't even like giving credit to man's books, because 
when no matter what book I read, even Napoleon Hill, all everything he says about the way you think, it comes from the Holy Bible. It's, it is. It's all based in the Bible. When I anybody's book, no matter who it is, Zig Ziglar, John Maxwell, Jack Canfield, Jim Rohn, all wisdom. I've never heard anything that is not that's that is wisdom that's not based in the Bible. Nothing original. It's just a different way of saying it. And that's that's so for me, man, that's what we have to understand. So we have to understand that we are born with disposition. We have to understand what is working against us and why it's working against us. And then that knowledge turns into power because now we understand what we have to work against and how we need to go about doing it. That's uh, I, I love it, Tony. And uh, you said that success and sex, both driven and given by God, is, is that your belief? Is that what you, how you see things? Uh, can you elaborate on that? Do you think that we as men, the success that we yearn for and we want to drive for, is that something that God is, is giving us and God has instilled within us each? Yes, I believe God created us all to be millionaires, that he created us all to be successful. Millionaire meaning, you know, just a number. A millionaire for you could be 100,000 a year, 50,000 a year. But I believe God created us all, you know, every man to be successful because that's how we build the world. So when you think about it, without success and without sex, mankind ceased to exist. But that drive in us is what what allowed man to create a plane, to create a train, to create a computer, uh, to create a car, to create a house, to create a college, um, a high school, a middle school, an elementary, that drive for success, to be established, to have something, that's what built our world. And then the drive of sex is what replenishes our world. So I believe both are necessary evils that we can make and turn into good if God is in the middle of it, if he's in the midst and he's directing our path so that your your success can mean something real and not just be for you, but be a blessing to others. And then your sex can mean something real and be the bond and the connection that sweeps your wife off of her feet, that makes her feel the love of God from God, but also through you, as the Bible tells us, husbands love your wives the way Christ loves the church. And then to reproduce kids from that sex that you raise up in God's image, in the image of God, but also in the image of you, which is an extension of God to go out into the world and carry on and live out the legacy that you've left. Legacy means to leave a gift. So you leave your legacy of knowledge and wisdom and understanding to your kids. You don't even have to leave them money if you leave them a real legacy. Mm-hmm. They'll know how to make their own money. I, I like it. And I'm glad you you clear that up a little bit because sometimes I feel in the fellowship, you know, at church and stuff, uh, you know, you, brother see you trying to do live a non-mediocre life and, they, and they're quick to judge. And like, you know, I'm here, I, I'm, I'm a disciple of Christ, but that doesn't mean that I'm not trying to provide for my family and do and do better and be, and be better. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the Bible tells us in, in the study of the talents, you know, that the one who has the most, he will also take from the one who has the least. <laughs> and, and, and so you either have or you have not. But God tells us to study the ant. So why would he tell us to study the ant? Because she sleeps not if he didn't create us to be successful, because the less you sleep, the more successful you're going to be. And I I don't mean that literally meaning like sleep one hour. But you know what I mean? You're not slumbering. Mm -hmm. You're not folding your arms during the work day. But you get a night's rest and you get up and you grind, you grind, you study the ant. And if you are being productive like that, you're going to reap the benefits. So today at 31 years old, as a black man in the South who was against every odd coming from uneducated parents, by the time I was in the fifth grade, I could read and write and spell better than my parents. So at 31 years old, to be a, a God made millionaire and 
to own five companies from real estate development, new media, production, nonprofit, and so on, and to be number one in my field, but also be married and faithful with two kids. That's the work of God. That's what God intended for us to have the abundance on earth. And we go from glory to glory because when you lay your head down, you're moving on to heaven. But a lot of us have accepted this defeated mentality that says, oh, I have to struggle and I have to be poor in order to serve God. And if I make enough, if I make too much money, that's not of God. But Mm -hmm. no. God tell us that when you give, which means you live your purpose, that you'll be given so much it'll be pressed down, shaken together and still running over. And I remember reading about the wisest man to ever live, Solomon. And I read a book that was written in layman terms, not not the whole book. I read a few pages and it laid out his his kingdom. And it was like he had 24 carat pure gold columns and bed posts and All of that. He was a life coach, too. The queen came. The queen paid him what would be equivalent of one point four million dollars for a coaching session. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and I'm like the wisest man on earth was also the richest man on earth because that is the byproduct. So when you God tells you in all you're getting, get understanding to get understanding means to get wisdom. You cannot get wisdom and remain broke, even if you want it to be broke. So I can spin like crazy, but because of the wisdom God has given me, I'm going to wake up rich again tomorrow because of what I've created based on his instruction of serving my purpose. So I'm not selling coffee. I'm not selling weight loss pills. I'm selling books and courses and seminars that will change your life. So I'm living my purpose. And as a byproduct, I'm being blessed because I'm sowing a seed. And with that seed comes a harvest, even if I don't want it to. If I sow it and it's water, the law of the land says that a harvest is coming. Tony, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tony, this is the last question and the man up round. And uh, I asked my guests all this question, but I would love to know, what is your definition of a, of a conquering man? Definition of a conquering man. First and foremost, he must be surrendered unto God. If he doesn't know God, he doesn't know himself. Secondly, he accepts 100 percent responsibility for his life because if he points the blame he can never change and thirdly i would say he does everything in his power to live his purpose while on earth so to submit to god be a hundred percent responsible and live a life of purpose to me that would be a conquering man and there it is Tony, I want to respect your time. So before we say goodbye, let us know how we can connect with you. Uh, how can we get introduced to your coaching, your training, uh, some of your books? And uh, tell us how we can attain all these things. And then we'll say goodbye. My name on social media is Tony Gaskin. So on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube, Instagram, it's my name, T-O-N-Y Gaskins, G-A-S-K-I-N-S. And my website has all my courses or have links to them. I'm I'm rolling out the Tony Gaskins Academy, which is really just kind of going to put all of my courses. So Speakers University, which has yet to be released, Real Love University, which will be the video course. It hasn't been released yet. The Birth Your Book Program, my Life Coaching Certification Program, my Birth Your Brand Program, my Entrepreneur University um, so I'm going to release all of those, put it on Tony Gaskins dot com so that I just believe in everything that I do to teach. And so it's just kind of paying it forward, you know, so that other people can take that wisdom, that knowledge, uh, because God gives us gifts in different ways. So for me to create business, that may be one of my gifts, but the next person may not have that same gift. But I don't that doesn't mean they don't have the mindset or the knowledge or the ability to learn it. Um, so please connect with me, social media, 
my website, my email, Tony at TonyGaskins.com. If I see it, I'm going to reply to it. There it is, Conquer Nation. Make sure I follow Tony Gaskin on all his social media uh, forums and uh, make sure to go to his website, TonyGaskin.com. Get his books, uh, participate, and just get involved. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and for blessing us from the mentorship. And uh, it has been an enlightening conversation, my man. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Conqueror Nation, that's a wrap for Session 003. Today's feature conqueror was Mr. Tony Gaskins, all-around outstanding man, setting the pace in the home and how to love and lead our families. He's the number one relationship coach and author. Go to TonyGaskins.com for all the resources that he has there. This session and this week's contest ends with Session 003 for audiobooks.com where they're going to provide you with three month subscription plus three credits to use towards any book of your choice. Make sure to go to conqueredmanhood.com slash 003 to enter the Big A giveaway. If you enjoyed this conversation today, please let Tony and I know over at Twitter or leave a comment on the blog and enter the Big A giveaway. Conquer Nation, until next time, conquer all. Thank you for listening to Conquering Manhood. Now, it is time for you to conquer all. So take action. Head to conqueringmanhood.com and grab the four steps to conquering manhood. The ultimate guide for free.